What fascinates me is that hardly anyone is wondering what we're actually doing on this planet. Most accepted the work, eat, entertainment, sleep cycle as life and have no desire for a deeper understanding of our purpose in this universe. My name is Brian. Welcome back to another video. It's been a little while. I took a break on the channel, but I know you're going to love this presentation, especially if you think along the same lines as that quote I just read you. I'm going to take you down the rabbit hole. It's basically a presentation on the convergence of spirituality, science, and certain religious concepts, and basically just helping to understand uh, our place in the universe for people who have not uh, actually explored this topic yet. So without further ado, let's get back to it. So first and foremost, who are you? Seems like a simple enough question. Most people would be tempted to talk about their profession. I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a mechanic, whatever it is. But you were not always your profession, so how could that be who you are? Quick answer, it's not. <laughs> uh, what about your body? Are you your body? You can control the body, so it gives you the illusion that it is you, in my opinion. And... It's a tricky concept to explore, but basically I, I've been dealing with chronic pain for many, many years now, and I was doing a lot of meditation years ago, and this was an idea that came to me. Would you give yourself medical conditions like heart disease, cancers, dementia? No, absolutely not. So how could you be the body or the body be you? It's not. It's something that is happening to you the same way that the wind happens to you or the way that you feel the sunlight and the heat on your skin. So in that regard, your body is something that is happening to you. More than half of your body is not even human. Microbes make up 57% of your body, your body's total cell count. Uh, your microbes being, you know, the gut bacteria in your stomach that's breaking down your food. There's nothing human about that. Thankfully, it's contained inside the stomach. Uh, and yeah, we only have 43% human cells. So our bodies aren't even human, in <laughs> mostly at least. So that's a crazy mind-blowing thing right there. Look it up on Google real quick if you uh, doubt it. So are you your thoughts and emotions? Well, your thoughts and emotions change and you're not always in control of your thoughts and your emotions. So how can your thoughts and emotions be who you are? Or even your belief systems. Your belief systems are subject to change. You didn't believe all that when you were first born. You were alive, but yet you're not your religion. You're not your thoughts. You're not your beliefs. You're something else. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, try to stop thinking right now. You know, I said this in one of my other videos too, but try to stop thinking and you'll quickly see that thoughts are something something that are happening to you just as much as the other stuff I just talked about. How the body is something that is happening to you. The thoughts are happening to you against your will. So the key is you are the conscious observer. The one aspect of you that has never changed and will never change. Uh, of course, I put the analogy on here of being young versus old. There's an underlying consciousness that has not changed from when you were a baby all the way up until this point in your life. Have you been able to detect any uh, shift of consciousness or uh, evolution of consciousness in any way? Uh, most people say they don't. And I put uh, another example of, as uh, being drunk versus sober there's the underlying consciousness which allows you to have the experience of being drunk or the experience of being sober or say if you're blind versus not blind or if you're losing some of your senses or you have all your senses the underlying consciousness remains and this is a great quote from Eckhart Tolle you are not in the now you are the now that is your essential identity. The only thing that never changes. Life is always now. Now is consciousness. And consciousness is who you are. That's the equation. And that's also a critical 
uh, aspect of this. The now is the only time that exists. The past is gone. The future hasn't yet to come. And but even by the end of this sentence, we're on to a new now. It's like, it's slippery. You can't even get it. If you try talking about it, it's already in the past. Now, this is a book, The Self-Aware Universe, How Consciousness Creates the Material World. I had this book from many years ago. As you can see, I'm holding it up for the camera. And uh, it's one of the earliest books that I read. And it basically covers, well, the author, first off, is Amit Daswami. He's a quantum physicist. He's also uh, Indian. I believe he's living in America now, too, so Indian-American. And uh, it's basically about the convergence of science, philosophy, and religion. How it seems like we're all from the same source. And uh, there's a spark of the divine within each and every one of us. And the spark of the div divine is in humans, I believe it's called Atman. And this was a very, very technical book. He, I mean, he's trying to create uh, quantum physics for the lay audience. Lay meaning people who aren't experts on it. So it, it was the hardest book I ever read. So Newtonian physics is what we experience in our everyday uh, life. You throw a ball in the air and the ball will come down. Stuff like that. Quantum physics is filled with mystery. Uh, I believe Albert Einstein called it spooky. And uh, it's just <laughs> incredibly difficult to put into words because it doesn't even make sense. But yet they mathematically confirm that it's real. And so I highly recommend this book if you want to dive into that subject. But I'm not a top expert on that, so I'm not about to try to dive into the weeds too much on that one. So an atom is about 99.99999, all those nines, percent empty space. If you removed the empty space from the atoms of all people, the entire human race could fit in the volume of a sugar cube. Everything that appears to be solid really isn't. Now, here are a few really important quotes. In quantum physics, every particle or group of particles in the universe is also a wave. Even large particles, even bacteria, even human beings, even planets and stars. And waves occupy multiple places in space at once. So any chunk of matter can also occupy two places at once. Physicists call this phenomenon quantum superposition. And for decades, they have demonstrated it using small particles. There was a uh, breakthrough study where they actually were able to see the quantum physics effects on an even larger particle than ever before. But I don't want to get into the, too much into the weeds of this. Quantum physics is hard to understand for sure. Quantum physics states that mass and energy are interchangeable and consequently that mass is merely a manifestation of energy. This means that everything, including humans, is simply energy stored in mass particle form. And why does that matter? Well, the law of conservation of energy states Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. And that's uh, Einstein quote, but others said it before him, I believe. So we are energy. Everything seems to be solid and uh, it creates the illusion of being solid, that is. And uh, the human body contains about a billion, 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 that's 10 to the 27th atoms, and that's mostly empty space. We are beings of frequency and vibration and energy. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. This includes our soul. We simply transfer locations and forms, but never are we destroyed. You are an infinite being here to learn and experience for the growth of your soul. Now, of course, not all of that is proven, but based on what you're about to see in this presentation, uh, I believe that is the case and that is true. And remember, the universe has been around that we guess right now, uh, what was it, 13.8 billion years. Do you really think the first time that you've ever existed 
was in this tiny blink of existence called a human life? I really don't think so. So, all right, let's keep going. This is another really powerful book that I read. Uh, one of the first ones that I read in this truth-seeking journey as well, The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot. Uh, also, side note, he was a gay man, openly gay, and very celebrated in the gay community. And uh, basically, the book touches on how everything is from the same source, all in the one and one in the all. And the reason why he titled it the holographic universe is look in the bottom right of the screen here. You see that's a, uh, these are holographic plates that are used to generate the holograms. And uh, what makes these plates special is that if you cut up that plate into thousands of pieces, each tiny chunk would uh, contain the whole image. The only difference is, is when you would try to generate the hologram, it would become blurrier and blurrier depending on how much you actually removed. So that is similar to how this universe is. As above, so below. And here we go. Here's some wild pictures. Take a look. Brain cells look very similar to the universe on the large scale. DNA can look like the double helix nebula out there. It's like the same patterns are happening, whether it's in the tiny uh, scale or whether it's in the gigantic universal uh, scale. The eye looks very similar to that nebula there. And here's some more examples of how your eyes are in general, can look very similar to nebula. I'm pretty sure these are all nebulas. We are the universe. Universe is us. Now, this is an interesting slide. It's about the rotational geometry at all scales of reality. The universe, black holes, galaxies, Earth's magnetic field or the geomagnetic field, cyclones, plant geometry, the human body, DNA, electromagnetics, photon geometry. And the human body one looks very, very similar to the Earth's magnetic field, I notice in the bottom left and right above it. Also, this reminds me of the Institute of Heart Math. What they have studied is the human heart and how we generate an electromagnetic field that broadcasts outside the body. And I'm wondering if... You know, have you ever been around somebody and then you just get these creepy vibes, these like, I don't know, stalker vibes? Or I wonder if some, if that uh, broadcast from the heart is generating out beyond the body and we're actually picking up on each other's vibes. Uh, I don't think that's proven, but I don't know. I, I'm curious about that. It seems like a possibility. So, all right, let's keep going. So I just wanted to point out the skeptics. Uh, I have more stuff to show you, but uh, Richard Dawkins here is one of the most famous skeptics. He's a really smart guy and he, his contributions are very valuable in science. He's an evolutionary biologist. But here are some of his quotes. He says, There is no life after death. Life was a happy chemical accident. He says there's no soul and we are the sum total of our genes. An accidental creation. Man, that just seems so ridiculous to me. But Graham Hancock was the, the guy who pointed this out. And uh, so shout out to Graham. Uh, no scientific studies conclusively show these statements. It's a belief system like religion. Think about it. There's nothing that he actually did in the scientific realm which actually would provide such statements or results which, which leads to the statements for example here love what if only two people in the world or one person in the world could feel love uh, science has no way of actually testing for love you might see physiological changes in the body and in various ways but that how does that translate to the conscious experience that we're all having when we love our family or friends uh, or your your loved ones in general or your partner, whatever. 
uh, that is the hard problem of consciousness. And for, also, for instance, when a sound wave hits your ear and it's interpreted by the brain, we don't know exactly how that physical stimuli and processing converts itself to the human experience that we're having on a day-to-day -day basis uh, every day. So, yeah, the hard problem of consciousness is more of a philosophical thing than it is a science one, but it's very important to keep in mind. Also, we barely know anything about most of the universe. So how could you say that there's no afterlife and death is the end when 96% of the universe is still unknown? It's dark energy and dark matter. Ordinary matter is like 4 to 5%, 4.9 in that chart right there. So we barely even understand the universe in any way. And then you got these uh, people who are dead inside who are trying to say that, no, that's the end. Be miserable with me. <laughs> so, all right, let's keep going. Now, this is one of the most important near-death experiences ever uh, documented. I'm about to show you here. This woman, Pam Reynolds, had her near-death experience in 1991. She was dead for one hour during a brain aneurysm surgery uh, where the blood was actually had to be removed from the brain in order for the doctor to be able to safely operate on the aneurysm. So she had no brain and no heart activity. I read recently that uh, there were 20 doctors involved on this highly complex and super, super rare uh, last ditch effort to save a life and uh, you ever see those stories where people fall into an icy lake and they're they'll be underwater for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever and you think they're dead there's no way they're gonna live then they pull them out and somehow they are, are revived uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes was too high it was at least 10 minutes stuff like that happened I forget uh, the exact uh, time on that and the reason I bring the icy lake stuff up is because pam actually had to have her body put on ice in order to give the doctors time to safely do the surgery it slows everything down also a brain aneurysm you see that image in the upper right uh, it's a weak or thin spot on an artery in the brain that balloons or bulges out and fills with blood so this this bulge is bulging into other parts of the brain and causing severe pain and uh, if it popped, that's pretty much death because, yeah, like you would just bleed out into your brain and ugh, can't even, I don't even like thinking about it. And here are some quotes from her and uh, what her beliefs are after the, after the event. It was the most aware that I think I have ever been in my entire life. It was brighter and more focused and clearer than normal vision. She hovered over her body and the doctors and later accurately described a bone saw and the interchangeable blades that were hidden before uh, surgery started and the anesthesia kicked in. You know, when you're at a doctor's office before uh, getting put under, they always have all the scary stuff hidden completely until you're out. Uh, so she was hovering around the room, hearing their conversations. Uh, when the doctor wrapped up, uh, his the, the main doctor wrapped up his part of the surgery, which was like the super complex part. He went and started playing music in the other room. She witnessed the music. Uh, she had no brain activity, no heart activity, and she's witnessing all of this. So she lost her fear of death. She says, If death is the worst thing that happens to us, what an incredible thing. If at the end of our lives, this is what's going to happen to everyone, I don't see the problem. I really don't get it. I fear pain, but I don't fear death. And that's that sums up my beliefs as well. I've been in chronic pain for many years because ankylosing spondylitis. And I think death is just a new beginning based on everything that I've seen. And uh, I don't really fear it, but I do fear pain. And uh, yeah. <laughs> me and Pam have that in common. Also, over 100 million near-death experiences have happened going back to ancient times. Uh, the, the way I got to that number is just a ballpark figure. Maybe it's a little bit lower or higher, whatever. Uh, there is a study where 9 million people had near-death experiences. 
uh, over 30 years from 1983 to 2013. And then you could extrapolate the data from there. But also, I was keeping in mind that uh, we've gotten better at bringing people back who are like borderline dying with all the new technology that we've uh, had in recent years. But there are ancient accounts of these experiences as well. And if only 30 years, we got 9 million. Uh, and also the population was lower back then. So I try to account. So 100 million is just a ballpark figure. But this is something that seems to happen to everybody. Uh, for those who have like a near-death experience and they experience nothing, perhaps they did not go deep enough into the experience of death or the transition, moving on to the next uh, spirit body, whatever. Words are just signposts, keep in mind, whatever you want to call it, your next uh, form, your next, the next entity you become, perhaps. Also, a quick note, I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson, I believe it was on a recent uh, Joe Rogan podcast, or it might have been somewhere else, but he was the subject of uh, near-death experiences came up and then he's just like ah, i don't believe it uh i i need a a piece of paper put on a shelf on the top shelf where nobody can read it and then when these people have these near-death experiences and hover outside the body they can read the note and then like when they're back in their body uh, they can tell the world what's on the note and we can definitively prove that near-death experiences are real. And that's just so ridiculous. I, oh yeah, actually, I think it was Joe Rogan. He pushed back on that, like saying, yeah, right. So if if the liter literally the most shocking thing that can ever happen is happening to you, you're outside of your body, looking down, hovering around, looking down at your dead shell of a body and... The last thing you're going to think about is like, oh, I, time to go read the note on the shelf. <laughs> uh, that way, when I can go back to the body, oh, yeah, let's get that. And also, I'll tell you another quick uh, couple stories uh, from near-death experiences that I read real quick. There was one where a woman had some kind of emergency. She was in the emergency room, had a near-death experience. She was hovering outside of her body, going through walls, through multiple uh, rooms over to the waiting room where I believe it was her daughter was waiting. And this daughter was dressed like a real goofball, like, uh, wearing some pajama clothes because she didn't even uh, change her clothing. She wanted to just get there as fast as possible. And then so when this lady woke up from the near-death experience, she told the nurses and the doctors to go tell her daughter to go change into some better more decent clothes um there was there was another one uh, so oh yeah so doctors are actually coming around to this especially emergency room doctors there's more and more of them like all the time that are becoming more open to near that death experiences and they become believers uh the other one i wanted to say was this one woman, I believe it was a woman, had a near-death experience. She hovered through the floor, or I mean through the ceiling, up uh, I think two or three uh, stories, and then she witnessed a guy and a girl flirting. They were like two employees of the hospital flirting. Uh, she came back to the body, woke up, and she said uh, that this was happening. And then later they were able to confirm that these two were flirting. And so Neil deGrasse Tyson wants a note. We got a million times better than a note already. So, all right, Neil deGrasse. Oh, he's a great guy, though. Overall, I have nothing but respect for him. But when you're one of the top heads uh, of the establishment, you got to toe the establishment line a little bit. And that's what he's doing. Time to throw in a little humor. You ever look in the mirror for too long and start thinking, damn, I'm really a human. Like, I'm really in this bitch. <laughs> oh my God. I love that meme so much. Like, and there's other ones too. This was just the funniest looking one. Like he's trying to look into his own eyes. Like what the hell is going on here? But I think why it's funny is because consciousness at its core is beyond just the human experience. You look around, you got all sorts of animals. They have eyes and they're conscious. They get jealous. There's all sorts of... I mean, it looks like their consciousness is 
almost identical to our consciousness, but we have different limitations based on what species we're in. Like uh, we're way beyond monkeys and and apes, and the DNA difference isn't even that much. It's like a tiny fraction. Uh, imagine what's out there. Perhaps some aliens that are that percentage of DNA, whatever it is, even more advanced than us. I mean, yeah, anyways, that was a little tangent, a little fun tangent. Um, but meditating, which I did a lot when, uh, many years ago, it, if you go deep enough, it does get you into timeless, pure awareness. And it, it feels like you transcend being in a human body. It's like this really deep, amazing experience i never had training but I, so i don't i don't know whatever the terms are i'm sure that you know there's some kinds of terms out there that would describe it better i guess also some animals seem like they're smarter than all the other animals like uh my brother's dog we had a conversation and this dog seems like polite and it seems like she's ready to make the transition to becoming a human in the next life or whatever but it's speculation, but it's fun. Who knows? Next slide. There's another powerful Eckhart Tolle quote. You don't have a life. You are life. The one life, the one consciousness that pervades the entire universe and takes temporary f form to experience itself as a stone or a blade of grass, as an animal, a person, a star, or a galaxy. I think it's true. And Eckhart, he's, he's my favorite. He and uh, Alan Watts are the two best, in my opinion. And I wanted to talk about a stone having intelligence as well. That sounds weird. Uh, and of course, the reason why a stone remains a stone and why it isn't a blade of grass or wood or a tree or whatever else is because it goes back to uh, chemistry and physics. But some intelligence went into designing this universe. Something designed chemistry and physics to act in this very manner to get us to the point where we're at now. And going back to the self-aware universe, it's possible that consciousness is the primary purpose of the universe for us to be alive and to experience the universe. Uh, Alan Watts does talk about that a lot too. The creator of this universe might not know every single experience that every single living conscious being will uh, experience, but it's I've heard this analogy before about a, a stone being kicked off a mountain. You don't know each bounce it's going to take all the way to the bottom, but you know it's going to arrive at the bottom. And it's similar to a human life. A human life, we don't know every twist and turn, every car accident, every, you know, any wild things that can happen on a daily basis. But we do know the end, and the end is death, and then we're going to transfer into the next experience. It's a new beginning, nothing to fear. <laughs> and, yeah, most people don't look at death the way I do, but that's why I don't even see the name of my channel dead man dreams as really like a negative title but then when i tell other people what the name of it is that's like it feels more negative than it really is but oh well every name just comes up short anyway so you are a function of what the whole universe is doing in the same way that a wave is a function of what the whole ocean is doing alan watts put it very beautifully there and back to some more science stuff. Carl Sagan. You could tell I like Sagan a lot. I put him in my other videos too. But the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. Now this is an image that Sagan really made popular. I believe he included it in his original Cosmos series. Neil deGrasse Tyson did the remake of Cosmos uh, more recently. So on February 14th, Valentine's Day of 1990, this photo was taken by NASA's Voyager 1 space probe from about 3.7 billion miles from the sun. It turned back and took this of Earth. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. 
That's us. And Sagan also had other quotes about that. To use the Carl Sagan term, we are star stuff. The whole universe is related, but us being from Earth makes us even more related. Look at how tiny that little speck is in the middle of this near-infinite void. Oh, it's just, we have so much more in common with each other, just simply being alive and on Earth. And yet, all this bullcrap on Earth keeps on happening. Poverty, disease, fighting, more bullshit. Anyways... William Shatner uh, went on the first Blue Origin space flight, and that's Jeff Bezos, is uh, the guy who owns Amazon's uh, uh, space company. I don't know if it's just for tourism. I don't think he's trying to go all the way to Mars like Elon, but maybe things change. I don't know. Uh, so here's the quote from William Shatner. Uh, for those of you who don't know who he is, he's the original Captain Kirk, the main character on Star Trek, the one from the 60s late 50s it might have been i forget the years but i love the mystery of the universe all that has thrilled me for years but when i looked in the opposite direction into space there was no mystery no majestic awe to behold all i saw was death yeah and instead of finding comfort and friendship as a family of earthlings on our little oasis of life we get Racism, division, war, poverty, and a military-industrial complex that preys on us while they steer the world in the direction of World War III. All I have to say is AI and technology will soon solve the scarcity of resource problem. Uh, we're literally in the home stretch. This is the most dangerous time humanity has ever lived in it's the most exciting it's the most crazy we don't know what's about to happen look at all the wars and the uh, uh, nuclear weapons especially is, is the biggest threat but uh this new technology is coming and we'll be able to have uh, artificial intelligent workers working around the clock most scarcity is going most if not all scarcity of resources will be ended uh, we could also, in the near future, harvest asteroids that we know will have the materials of whatever we want, metal-wise uh, and rock-wise, of course. But uh, in the grand scheme, beyond things, I always like to say, we are barely beyond cavemen. They're going to look back in 100 years from now and laugh at how primitive we are because it's going to change very, very rapidly. It's going to be solving problems that we don't even know we have. That's how intelligent this AI is about to be. So, yeah. All we have to do is just make it down the home stretch. We should just take out loans if we have to to care for the people of, of the world so we don't have to have these garbage wars that can escalate and escalate into human extinction. And side note, Carl Sagan, along with another guy, came up with the... Uh, nuclear winter concept uh, of how basically the cl uh, no sunlight would be able to make it in no crops would be able to grow and if nuclear war happens the majority of the world i believe it was would wind up starving to death all we have to do is try to do our best to fight against war that's the most important thing we can possibly do and another reminder, every individual is a unique manifestation of the whole as every branch is a particular outreaching of the tree. And that's from Alan Watts. So the evidence seems to suggest that we are all one. In that sense, it is selfish to be kind to others. That's a, another uh, phrase that I guess I have grown attached to because it's just true and based on the evidence you know I may not have all the answers we're not meant to have all the answers but we know enough to care for each other to be kind and uh, to really help those in need so coming soon on this channel I will be covering more current events and politics you know I feel like I have to the times have never been crazier, and that means I'll be able to get videos out quicker. I'm a true independent voice. Uh, it's rare these days because you always got this 
dogmatic far leftist or dogmatic guy on the right hating on the other and anytime you say anything up you must be one of them you must be not nah, don't do that with me with me i'm as in the middle as it gets far left on certain things far right on some other things but pretty libertarian i guess you could say I've voted for three different parties, the Democrats, Republicans, and Libertarians in the past. And uh, yeah, so if you're looking for something unique, it's going to be here on this channel. Also, I am open to collaborations and uh, business inquiries. Uh, definitely, I wouldn't mind getting a sponsorship for the channel. Uh, the best way to contact me would be my Gmail. That is Dreams. 777 at gmail.com you can find it at the end of this video and usually in the comment section uh, i mean the descriptions so please if you can subscribe hit that like button uh, share it with your friends and as always memento mori peace out till next time if you're interested in exploring concepts similar to this video, be sure to click on the video on the left. Otherwise, the one on the right is best suited for you.